And thank you so much for giving some thought and consideration to the Operation Christmas Child Ministry. Uh, thank you for all of you who have uh, participated in that before. And uh, I can still see all the different shoe boxes up on the uh, steps here from previous Christmases uh, ago. So thank you. It is great to welcome you here this morning. And I'm Pastor Joey, and it's my privilege to talk to you out of the Bible each week. And one of the things that we're doing in this series, uh, What Love Does, is that we're looking at the application sections of the Pauline epistles. Uh, Paul's letters and what he does typically in his letters is he he will write uh, share some theology with you and then he will give you some application of what he just had shared with you some action steps that he would like for you to take and right now we're looking in the book of Romans chapter 12 uh, verses 9 through 21 in particular and and today uh, we're going to be looking at another uh, verse or two within this passage. Uh, why don't you just read along with me on the, uh, on the screen, if you would, and I'll just read through all the, uh, the uh, 10, 11, 12 verses here or so, and just kind of familiarize you with the passage once again. Uh, and we're talking this morning about being resilient. Uh, in previous messages, if I were to review with you, um, how about let's just flip it to slide seven quickly here and we'll just do a quick review. Uh, in previous messages, uh, we've looked at uh, love must be sincere, love does with a pure motive. Uh, and then next slide is we're choosing authenticity over hypocrisy. Uh, sometimes just being real with people. Um, sometimes sharing your failure is an act of love because it creates an authentic atmosphere where people can connect with you and maybe connect with others. And I've gone over it so many times. Uh, when we share failures, we build walls. Or when we share successes, we build walls. When we sh- share failures, we build bridges. And that's just the way life works. I don't know why it works that way, but it does. I think we're all maybe just a little insecure about life and, and our place in it. And sometimes, uh, it's like C.S. Lewis said, friendship is born when you look at something And you say to yourself and you're listening and talking with someone else and you look and you say, uh, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. You ever been there? And sometimes that's when friendship is born. Oh, I didn't know. You shared that experience as well. And so, uh, authenticity over hypocrisy. Next slide. We're going to, love does with a listening ear. Uh, Uh, Next slide, discernment over distraction. Sometimes a great act of love is just taking the time to listen. Uh, And you know that's becoming much more difficult these days with our smartphones and things. Uh, They've done studies on this and how the attention span is now down to seconds many times because we're used and conditioned now to just taking our information in a matter of seconds at a time. And so just taking the time to listen with an empathetic ear can be a ministry. Don't ever discount that. Just taking time to listen. And when we listen, we discern over distraction. We are learning things and discerning what our next steps are to be. Slide number 11, love does with a family affection. We, cho- we have chosen, we continue to choose respect over arrogance, brotherly affection, is uh, the phrase that's used in some of the translations of this particular area of of, uh, Romans 12. Respect over arrogance. Slide 12. uh, Sometimes to show someone respect, regardless of maybe the viewpoint shared, sometimes that's an act of love. Uh, Well, it always is an act of love because we want to get arrogant and we want to um, make our opinions known. And so... Uh, not show respect instead show disrespect and by that maybe get even or try try to let someone know that we disapprove Uh, there's a higher way to do that love does slide number 13 with the fresh energy we've chosen enthusiasm over burnout it's important that we bring all that we are and all that we uh, are about to life Um, what's what's the one quote that we used in this particular message, um, 
Don't ask what the world needs. Ask rather what makes you come alive because what the world needs are people who are fully alive. People who are enthusiastic in the life that they're living. And so it's important that we bring this and that is a gift. What does love do? It chooses enthusiasm over burnout rather than turn away in our burnout. We do what we've got to do to energize and to be able to bring all that we are to the table. And when we share that gift with the world, what a blessing it is. And so that's important. Well, love does, this morning, love does, uh, slide 15, love does with a joyful expectancy. Love does with a joyful expectancy. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That's a great way to live life. And I'm saying that love does with a joyful expectancy. Slide number 16, if you would. We're choosing resilience over despair. We're choosing to bounce back when dealt a setback in life. And um, Paul is one who knew, knew how to bounce back from things in his life. Uh, and he went through a lot of different uh, experiences where he struggled and, and he shares some of those with us. If we look on slide number 6, the guy that wrote our words here, okay, in Romans 12, this is the guy that says, I've, I've worked so hard, I've been jailed more often than my opponents have been jailed, I've been beaten up more times than I can count. I've been at death's door time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jews' 39 lashes, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked through three times. I've been immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. In hard traveling year in and year out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea of storm, and betray- betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. My goodness, you thought your life was hard. That's crazy. And this is the same guy, if we go back to slide three for me, slide three, this is the same guy that wrote these words, be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Boy, he had his share. Faithful in prayer. You know, like I said, I think that Paul models for all of us what it means to be resilient. And I think we love those who come up against these incredible odds and somehow they, they find something within, they, through the help of God, they learn how to be joyful in hope, how to be patient in their affliction, how to be faithful in prayer. You know, just this week, I was really blessed. If I were going to give a comeback year award to anybody in our congregation, do you know who I would give it to? And I don't know if he's here this morning. I can't see very well with the bright lights, but is Lance McFerrin here? Lance, yes, there he is. If I were going to confer a comeback from death award to someone who is now thriving and growing and learning and relearning, in fact, just this week, I saw him drive a pickup uh, or a Suburban down the road. Of course, somebody was in it with him. But he was driving, and this goes from a guy on the flat of his back with the helmet on his head because, you know, of the traumatic uh, brain injury that his brain sustained. This is a guy who I got to sit down with and have a conversation with. And he's coaching, and he's leading his family, and he's working. And I said, Lance, before I leave, I mean, this is crazy. It's just like if you turned out the lights and it's dark, you turned them on. That's the difference that God has uh, done in, in this guy's life. Through the grace of God, the prayers of the people, the love of his uh, wife and family. This, I mean, he definitely gets the comeback award, the comeback Uh, kid award okay for our congregation in this year because I said Lance before I go I want to pray for you 
And so I prayed with him there, and then I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And then he looked at me, and he said, Joey, he said, um, can I pray for you? And he took me my, by the hand, and he prayed for me this week. Now you go from what I saw about, well, several months ago, to a guy who's now holding my hand and praying for me. He'd never done that before. But God is just so so, has so softened his heart and his life and is so using his love. It just love is just flowing out of Lance McFerrin like I've never seen. Praise God. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. I just love that. Just the love of Jesus. It's just amazing what God has done. Definitely the comeback comeback kid award goes to him. But Paul would love Lance McFerrin. And he would love all the people who no matter what you go through and what you're up against this morning, that you have this choice that you make to be resilient because when you choose resiliency, when you choose to bounce back, guys like me look at that and say, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, maybe this is a situation I've got. Maybe it's not brain injury. Maybe it's not coming back from the dead, as it were. But I've, I'm up against some odds in my life, and I, I want to bounce back. I don't want this to eat me alive. I have got to overcome this. I've got to have strength to prevail. And Paul is showing you right here in this, in this staccato imperative, to use the phrase that John R. W. Stott, the great British theologian, who says these are quick rapid-fire commands or imperatives that Paul gives here to try to spur the people on toward energy and enthusiasm. And he says, don't be lacking in zeal. All from a guy shipwrecked and beaten and stoned. Don't be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It's all about Him. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. This is how you come back. This is what love does. Because we need people who are resilient. Because we sometimes need to r- let them rub off on us, right? I like the guy that entered his donkey into the Kentucky Derby. Have you heard that one? He entered his donkey into the Kentucky Derby. And someone asked him why. And he said, well, he said, I know he doesn't have a chance of winning, but I thought the association might do him some good. Okay? Sometimes, sometimes, that's the way I feel when I race. Okay? I have, I have no chance of winning, but the association does me some good. Okay? I I feel like I can do more when I'm with those men and women. Okay, so sometimes we need that in our life. And it's an act of love. You see that? It's an act of love that you're going to blaze the resiliency trail because somebody coming in behind you is going to feed off that inspiration. And they're going to be able to step a little higher and run a little faster. Stay with it a little longer because you chose to be resilient. You see, this is deeper love. This is truer love. This is biblical love. It's so much bigger and greater and better than what we've seen or experienced in the world. And Paul says you can bounce back. You know, that's got, that ball has bounced, right? And that's what, that's, what, that's what Paul wants us to do and to be, is to, live, to be the bounce back kid award people. And bounce back kid recipient award because because we have made a decision and the way I'm going to bounce back the way I'm going to maintain joyful hope and patience in affliction and faithfulness in prayer look at the phrase right before verse 12 serving the Lord that's how we bounce back that's who we're about glorifying we're bouncing back for him and I'm going to share with you in just a little bit about just some practical handles that you can grab a hold of this truth this morning and you can kind of take some things with you as you leave but you know sometimes our bounce back is more like this and we just kind of sit there and you know we we really want it to be this way right and so and so Paul says if you're going to have be a bounce back kind of person and I'll tell you who else was a bounce back kind of person was the Lord Jesus Christ If anybody ever bounced back from death, he did. And what a horrible set of circumstances. And so we know that this joy we have is in Jesus. 
and this hope is for Jesus, and this patience is from Jesus, and this tribulation is with Jesus, and this constant prayer is through Jesus to God the Father, we need Jesus to bounce back. And I don't know, you know, what set of circumstances or context you brought with you to the church this morning, but if you're going to bounce back consistently in life, if you're going to bounce back from what you've gone through, you're going to need Jesus. The ultimate one who bounces back. You're going to need guys like Paul speaking into your life. uh, Helping you to see what it is that the frame of mind that we have to have if we're going to bounce back. I like, uh, and it's in your version notes this morning, uh, I like how the voice uh, translates Romans 12 and 12. And so re- I guess I didn't read the whole passage like I had planned on it, okay? So we're just, I just jump in and go, go in here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to stay with verse 12. We're just going to keep going here. But do not forget to rejoice for hope is always just around the corner, the voice paraphrase says. Hold up through the hard times that are coming and devote yourselves to prayer prayer listening to God and and you speak to God and he listens and and God speaks to you and you listen and and I've become even in uh, these uh, middle age years of my life the wordless prayers are sometimes the most powerful where I just listen and the Lord speaks in those quiet moments the message translates it be alert servants of the master cheerfully expectant don't quit in hard times Paul says, pray all the harder, is how Eugene Peterson says it in the message. Pray all the harder, he says. Don't quit in hard times. Boy, we've been praying a lot. Uh, We've been praying that God will help our kids to be resilient in whatever they face in life. One of the big challenges right now is Will trying to, uh, and he did, praise God. He was able to get through Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And... uh, and uh, it, it, in fact, this week, we're going to drive south. He's going to come east. We're going to intersect probably somewhere in about Tennessee. We're going to get stuff from him. He, give him a few things. He's going to get carved up because he's going to ranger school in Georgia. And so uh, it's going to change of plans a little bit. And so we're going to see how that goes. And, and uh, he's, he's wanting to, uh, I understand, wanting to carve up a little bit. And he, he, and he requested Johnny Marzetti of all things. So we're going to take some Johnny Marzetti from northeast Indiana down to somewhere in Tennessee and meet him. And, and, uh, and he's going to be up against a, some really some tough, a, a tough 62, 64 days there. Uh, where he's going to have to be resilient and bounce back and believe when he's out there shivering in his underwear, okay, in the mud and laying in the, laying in the crap, uh, he's going to have to believe that he can bounce back. And, and you're going to have to come into this thing with a hope, patience in affliction, and faithful in prayer. That's, that's, a ranger, that's a ranger verse right there if I've ever seen one. And uh, it reminded me a couple years ago he went to uh, Alaska for mountain warfare training. And this was like sophomore, between sophomore, I think sophomore, junior year, freshman, sophomore year. I'm not quite sure which year that was. It was a couple, three years ago. And he was trying to learn how to fight on glaciers and in cold weather and things like that. And it's really a challenge. And uh, he said one guy showed up and they did the first thing and he got cut the first thing. He said the guy came back, they already had his bags packed and everything. He was sitting by the door and they put him, sent him back home. And he said, man, that put the fear and trembling in me because I didn't want to be one of those guys that got sent home that quickly he wasn't there you know 12 hours and he's already on the bus back home you know or the plane back home so uh he said that really put the fear and trembling in he said he had to learn how to tie like 50 to 100 knots i don't know how many just a bunch of them and he said at one point he was tying the knot and you're on the clock and you have so much time and you got to leave about four on one particular knot you got to leave about four inches because if you don't have that four inches of rope or paracord left you're not going to complete your knot per specification and he was trying to get that thing tied and he saw it was going to be really close and he said my whole body started shaking because if I didn't get the knot I'm out of the program and he's shaking he says I'm just shaking I just can't it's like oh of all things four inches of a paracord a piece of paracord rope is going to knock me out of this thing and he said he said he knew it was going to be close but he kept going he got it he cinched it tight and boom it was enough that he needed to get it done but We've been praying a lot because uh, that's the only thing we can do. And when you become a parent and you see the knots in your kids' lives, and I don't know what kind of knots you got in your life, the stuff that 
you know, that challenges you, the stuff that maybe is going to set you back in life, and you're, you're afraid this morning, and you literally shake because you don't know if you're going to be able to have what it takes to get through that next affliction or that next uh, challenge in life. This is what you have to have if you're going to make it through. You need the Lord, serving the Lord. You've got to have Jesus. But in with Jesus at work in your life, you can be joyful in hope. It's going to get better tomorrow. You can be patient in affliction. You're going to have a... And the word patience means it's hypermoon. Uh, uh, it means to up under is the Greek. I looked at the Greek and defined that a little more precisely this week. When you're patient, you remain up under something. When you're patient... You stay under. You, you, you're not quick to get out from under the pressure. Because that's our tendency. You stay up underneath it. And let God do His work in it. And you let Him guide and orchestrate and, and lead you while you're underneath the burden of it. That's what it means to be patient. Patient and you stay up under and faithful in prayer. You're, you're, uh, you, you pray with frequency and fervor. And sometimes they're wordless prayers. And sometimes they're worded prayers. And we're, we verbalize and sometimes we don't. We listen and, and back and forth it goes. And so if we're going to be resilient, we need the Lord. We need that jo- the hope that things will get better, that God will use my messes for His glory. And, that's, that's, uh, and that ultimately he does, he does work through our messes. He, get, he gave us Jesus who's ultimately going to give us a better world. We understand that. Eschatological hope is huge in the Bible. God breaks in and this thing transitions to a beautiful ending. But uh, there's also the hope that he can somehow redeem and reconcile all this messy stuff that I've done in my life. Somehow he can use it to help me bounce back and to help others bounce back. Even though maybe I haven't always been what I needed to be. God used my mess to glorify you in some way. That's hope. And so rather than lamenting in despair this morning, what love does, what Paul does, he calls us to rejoice in hope. Rather than escape, Paul calls us to endure tribulation. Rather than neglect prayer, Paul urges us to persist in prayer. This is how we bounce back. That's how we bounce back. From Paul's perspective. You know, I came across a great quotation this week by one of the great uh, revivalists, and theologians of the 1700s his name is Jonathan Edwards in 1800s Jonathan Edwards and it's a sermon that he entitled Christian Happiness in fact uh, there are three reasons why any Christian can bounce back why we, why we can be content and free from uh, debilitating worry in our life and it's on the front of your bulletin conveniently put right there so you can reference it And this is what Jonathan Edwards said. He said, Your bad things will turn out for the ultimate good. Your good things can never be taken away from you. And the best things are yet to come. Isn't that great news? That's news that you need today. And that's news that you need to bounce back. And Jonathan Edwards maybe had this verse in mind. Uh, Romans 12, 12, when he, when he said those things, your bad things will turn out for ultimate good. Be joyful in hope. God is at work. Your good things can never be taken away from you. Patient in affliction. Hold with it. God's building something through the pressure. He's building you through the pressure. And then he says, and the best things are yet to come. Be faithful in prayer. Prayer is an invitation to engage with God, to co-create a better future with Him. That's what prayer is. It's an invitation to shape things. And God has chosen to shape the future through the prayers of His people. And uh, I often tell people that there's lots of resources available. And when we, when we pray, it's like... It's like a big balloon with water in it and and a prayer punctures that balloon and a little bit of water starts coming out and another time we pray again and again and again and all the holes just keep getting placed in those resources and and the more we pray, the more holes that that those blessings have to flow through into our life. I think Edwards was on to something about resiliency there. And I think he probably had this verse in mind maybe when he... Or, or uh, truths similar to the truths that are presented in this verse. And so I want to ask you a question here this morning. Is, is my life full of joy in hope? Or is it full of despair? 
Do I joyfully persevere in tribulation or do I grumble as I muddle through it? Am I devoted in, to prayer or do I dabble at it? Like I said, when you become a parent, you kind of stop dabbling in prayer and you really start interceding in prayer because you realize not only you, but your family's up against some things and they're not going to make it without prayer and without hope and without patience. And you just start praying that God will release that in their life. Like I said, I think we have great respect for people who can bounce back, who can stay hopeful, who can stay put under pressure, who can stay connected and work their way back to a place of wholeness in life again. And maybe this, this morning you've asked yourself the question, you know, how do I persist in the face of adversity? What can I do to be one of those bounce back kind of people? Be honest with who I am, honest with life and the facts, but how can I bounce back consistently in my life? Well, I think there's some ways to help us think about this. Apostle Paul models this, the author of Romans. These are examples we look across the book of Acts and other places and what he experienced in his life. And there's at least five or six things here. I'll just hit these quickly and they're in your version notes if you have a U version, the Bible app, U version, Y O U V E R S O N S I O N, U version. You can get that, and I use that routinely from week to week to give you notes right out of you know some of my preparation notes and things. And so, number one, you got to redefine what failure means to you. If you're going to bounce back, you have to redefine what failure means to you. Paul believed that. Failure can't be final when Jesus uses it so much in his life to shape him. So failure is never final and you've got to redefine it. So we stop focusing on all the ways we've messed up and we start thinking about the information that failure provides. Someone said that failure is actually part of success. It's the first step. And we all need it. We all need a little failure in our life to help us to realize some things. And that's sometimes the best... I've learned so much more of my failure than I have my victories. I've learned so much. And I can just think of all the times of failure in my life. When I was younger, a a grouse was right in front of me. And my dad said, you can get him, you can get him. And so I'm like, I... I didn't think I was close enough. And so I had, you know, I had my 12 gauge, 20 gauge, I think, at the time. And I was just trying to ease up closer before I would squeeze off the shot. And, of course, you know what happens. Grouse are very um, keen and they have great eyesight. And so it flew. And and it's like, man, I, I blew that. My dad would have been so proud of me. He would have loved to see me pull up and just pop that thing and feathers go everywhere he would have just he, he was a country guy he would have just he would have still he would have, he would have died grinning just ear to ear he would have just been in his casket just grinning if I would have done that but I didn't I didn't I failed right in front of him you know that was my big chance and I didn't I didn't come through one time I was on an all star team in baseball I was in left field and um uh, The guy hits one, and and it's just kind of a routine fly ball, but it gets right in the lights. I mean, that thing, the ball just stays in the lights. I I got this, you know, I'm I'm ready, I'm ready. Come on, come out of the lights. It never came out of the lights. It stayed in the lights the whole cotton picking time. I'm like this, the ball hits here, and the center fielder comes over and fills it for me. So, I failed. I don't know how, bases were loaded, I don't know how many... I don't know how many runs scored, but I mean, it felt like it was all day they were going around the bases. One time I went home from, uh, from out of state, and uh, it was just something little, something simple. My sister was sitting by herself, and we were at a funeral home. I think somebody had died in our extended family, and she was just sitting by herself in the funeral home, and I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I walked back and I saw my cousin sitting in the row in front of her. And I went and sat by my cousin, not my sister. I know that sounds silly to you, but I think I heard her when I did that. You know what? I'm really getting vulnerable. I could just go on and on and on 
about the stupid stuff I've done in my life. And you would sit there and you would enjoy it. Okay? I know you would. You'd enjoy every bit of it. Because it's like, yeah, God needs to taste a little of that stuff sometimes. You have no idea the failure of my life. I've had a bunch of them. Just little things like that. And then they get bigger. They go from little stuff to big stuff. And then it's like, I, I start talking about that. I'll never get through my point. So, uh, you got to redefine what that means, though. You can't, you can't let that define you in the rest of the way you go. You've got to learn from things. And so now I always try to, you know, when I'm back home in town or whatever, I want to make sure I give time and attention to my family and learn from those times when I maybe neglected them. And, uh, but you've got to redefine what failure means to you. If you don't, if you don't redefine it and failure is going to define you, you'll never do this. Okay, your life will be about like that. You'll never come back from much of anything because your failure is all that you're about. Number two, experience disappointment, but don't wallow in it. One of Paul's most joyful letters, the book of Philippians, was written while, while he was incarcerated. Now you think about that. He's in prison and he writes one of the most joy-filled letters of the New Testament. The word joy or its derivative, joyous or, you know, its derivative, it appears multiple times in that little book of four chapters. And he wrote it while he was in prison. Experience disappointment, but don't wallow in it. Allow yourself to experience the frustration and disappointment. That's life. That comes with failure. But get up and get going again. That's what it means to bounce back. Number three, practice appreciation and gratitude for other people and what they do for you. If you're not looking at the, the, the blessings that other people are in your life, you're not going to bounce back very well because you're all internal and everything's negative. Number three, go with the flow and improvise. You ever heard that before? Go with the flow and and improvise. We're talking about bouncing back, redefining failure, experiencing disappointment, not wallowing in it, practicing appreciation, gratitude for other people. Number four, go with the flow and improvise. There's a time to stand against the current, especially when values are involved. But so many things in life you can't do a thing about. It's too big. And so adaptability and flexibility and flow are the, are, are, are the key things that enable resilient people to bounce back and to manage the unpredictability of life. Paul improvised when one door closed. When he, when he was shipwrecked here, he said, okay, that's fine. I'll get up, dry myself off. I'll go this direction. And he went a different direction. And so he improvised. And that's what we've got to do if we're going to bounce back. We have to improvise. If one door closes, I'll go through another one. And I'll continue to let Jesus guide me in all of it. And I'll, I'll honor him with my life. And then the, the fifth thing here, if you're going to bounce back, we lean on our support system. It's amazing how many friends Paul had around him. In fact, at the end of Romans, he says thank you and, and he, how much he appreciates. You know what? 18 men and 15 women. Women were very prominent in the early church. Very high, they were highbrow women, high status women. And we see this from other ways and, and other uh, uh, letters. But these women and men in Paul's life was his support system. And it's, inter it's interesting too that when we look at the book of Acts, occasionally the writer of Acts goes into um, second uh, person, plur uh, first person plural when he says we. He puts himself in the story. And Luke includes himself. He says, we went here. We did this. We did that. Not just Paul did this and Paul did that. We did it together. It's the power of we. And Paul had that support system in his life. And I tell you what, the local church is an incredible support system in your life. If you're going to bounce back, don't try to do it alone. You need people in your life. If you're going to bounce back from failure of any kind... You need to redefine what failure means, experience disappointment, don't wallow in it, practice appreciation and gratitude for people in your life, go with the flow and improvise. Paul again models this. Learn, lean in, lean in and, and lean on your support system. If failure defines you, if you wallow in disappointment, if you never show gratitude, if you can't imp improvise or flex with life, if you have no support system, no bounce. Maybe a couple and you're done. But if you do these things, Paul says, you know, there's some bounce in your life. You can bounce back and you can 
going to accomplish what God's calling you to accomplish, and you can be an inspiration to other people. Well, there's actually one more here. By the way, anybody want this? Here we go. Boom. Okay. Okay. Off the lights. Okay. I got another one. I'll go a little lower this time. Boom. All right. So I'm not going to throw this one. This one's actually... Where did the other ball go? Okay. Well, somebody can fetch that after church, maybe. But th- this one's a little harder. If that one hits you, that's going to hurt you. So I'll, here, I'll give this to Wes. Boom. Maybe Wes will use it somewhere. But uh, there's one other thing here. Is, and I would just say this when it comes to bouncing back. Hang on to humor. Uh, we can appreciate things a whole lot more uh, uh, and when we can appreciate the humor in something that's usually pretty heavy or serious it's a way of dealing with it Um, it's a way of saying that this is not going to sink me I'm going to bounce back from this and there were some false teachers that were touting their credentials at the time that Paul wrote the the Second Corinthians passage that I just read where all those things had happened to him. Um, and they were touting their credentials and you kind of dig into that a little bit and you realize that they were challenging his authority to tell them what to do, to redefine things like the gospel and to show people that they could be Christians without becoming Jewish and doing all the necessary things to be a good Jewish person. Uh, or religious person and that really didn't set well with a lot of very rigid and pharisaic people but anyway they were challenging his authority and Paul says okay you guys want to challenge my authority you want to challenge my resume all right let me give you my resume and he's grinning while he writes it and it's just a mild it's a mild attempt at sarcastic humor okay in other words when he's done with that paragraph And he looks at those guys and their eyes are about that big and now he can say, now which one of you matches that resume? Okay? So he's being sarcastic. Got a little sense of humor going too. And not one of them would step up and say, okay, I'll sign up for that, Paul. So he had them. He had them. And so it's important to hang on to humor if we're going to bounce back. And you know, slide number 23, uh, there's a guy... Bob Goff, I've referenced him before. And I think this is, this is something that he does really well. And this is one of the reasons why I think he's probably been resilient in his life. And he, he writes a, a little essay, a little personal experience story that he entitles The Reach in his book, Love Does. It was his first real job. And he says... It was at uh, Lear's Greenhouse Restaurant. He says Lear's was a fantastic glass building designed to look like an arboretum. And each table, he says, was was set inside its own white gazebo. He says uh, that the crystal and china place settings were perfect in this restaurant. The waiters wore black tuxedos and cummerbunds and bow ties. And Bob said, and I'll quote him, he says, when I applied to work at Lear's Greenhouse Restaurant, I imagined how great I would look in a tux. He says, I would, how I would, I, I, I visualized how I would memorize the menu and make every prom date or or business dinner, a flawless experience. He said in order to become a waiter at Lear's Greenhouse, he had to start as a bus boy and work his way up. And he said it was hard work being a waiter, but someday he knew it would be worth it. And so as a bus boy, he learned that the white gazebos and the crystal and the china, it made for some really tight and hard to maneuver situations. And as a busboy, it was hard enough to reach across the table, he said, and get the dishes with nobody even there. And he couldn't imagine having to navigate that with people that were seated at the table all the while. And how the, you know, the waiters would have to serve them and navigate all the breakable things and, and still do a good job. And he knew that would be hard, and it was hard enough for him just to bust the table without breaking something, much less serving people while they were there at the table and he's trying to do what he needs to do 
And so he says on his one year anniversary at Lear's Greenhouse Restaurant, the manager pulled him aside and said, Bob, I think you're ready. Get your text. I think we're going to bump you up to server. He'd been working a whole year and he said he was at the tuxedo shop the very next morning when it opened and and on his first opening night as waiter, he was so excited that he could hardly eat. He said, I sprinted out from my apartment and I grabbed some quick Mexican food around the corner because they wouldn't let us let, let all the waiters eat the food at the restaurant he was working at, okay? It was pretty, pretty good stuff and they had a rule and he couldn't eat that. So he rushed out and he got some Mexican food and he rushed back. He put on his expensive tuxedo and uh, he said it was so expensive that he only paid half of it and he was planning on paying the other half with tips that he would earn over the next couple of months. He, uh, he hops in his VW Bug. He drove to the restaurant. And he parked around the corner so nobody would see what he drove up in. You've done that before. The night, he said, was cloudless. Patrons could see the stars through the glass ceiling. It was Bob's moment to enter the big stage in the tuxedo. It was his moment. He'd worked hard for it. The manager and the, and the host escorted uh, his first guest to one of the elegant gazebos in Bob's zone that evening. And the men in the group were starched and tidy, and he said the women looked like they had stepped off the cover of Vogue magazine. Bob put napkins on all their laps, and he gave them the speech that he had rehearsed a dozen times. He told them about all the incredible choices they had. He tried to set up what was going to be their best dining out experience of their lives. He placed their orders and after a short time he returned to the gazebo with the steaming plates. And as he was making the big reach across the table, it was a wide table at that, and he was carefully avoiding the china and the crystal, he said he felt a massive rumbling somewhere south of his belly from the Mexican food he had eaten. He said there was no time to react. At the pinnacle of his full extension across the table with a plate of prime rib, out came what he describes as the most impressive and lengthy gassing you can ever imagine. He said it went on forever. (laughs) He couldn't stop it. He says, I think I could have sounded out the alphabet. After his episode, he said, I think I heard one of the women scream. The men were shocked. There was a hushed silence, he says, and he just stood there. Afraid to move because it might trigger an aftershock. He said one of the men rushed up from the table and he went straight to the manager and told him everything. And Bob was fired on the spot. He says, with my cummerbund in one hand and bow tie in the other, I walked back to my VW bug with my head hung low. I sat in the front seat and I took a deep breath and I wondered what I was supposed to feel at a time like this. He says, on one hand, I destroyed a year's worth of work. I'd earned the waiter spot playing in the minor leagues, bussing tables, and when I finally stepped up to the plate in the big leagues, I messed it up. For the next six months, I made payments on that tax until I dropped it off at Goodwill. And he goes on the right. And I share this with you because he's one resilient person. He says, the thing I love about God is he intentionally guides people into failure. He made us born as little kids who can't walk or talk or even use a bathroom correctly. We have to be taught everything. All that learning takes time. And He made us so we we are so dependent on Him and our parents and each other. And the whole thing, He says, is designed so we try again and again and again until we can finally maybe get it right. And the whole time, He is endlessly patient. Bob said even Jesus talked about losing your life or losing your job 
finding true life and true purpose in all of it. And Bob says that Jesus comes looking for us in times like this. And things that that go wrong, they can shape us or scar us. And he says, you know, I've had some things go well in my life. Some things that didn't go so well, just like you, he says. More have gone well than have gone poorly, but I'm not trying to keep score because I have a different way of measuring those things now. He says God finds us in our failures and our successes. And he says that while we used to think one way about things, now he wants us to think another way about those same things. And then he says what I think is a profound statement of resiliency. He says, and for me, I've realized that I used to be afraid of failing at the thing that really mattered to me, but now I'm afraid of succeeding at the things that don't matter. I've realized that I used to be afraid of failing at the thing that really mattered to me. But now I'm afraid of succeeding at the things that don't really matter. By the way, Bob Goff is a very successful lawyer today. He does, he pursues justice uh, for kids in Uganda. And he could probably eat at any restaurant he wanted to. In any place in the world at this point in his life. He was resilient. He bounced back. Never lacking in zeal, Paul writes. Keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful, faithful in prayer. And this morning, I want to ask you, church, what do you need to bounce back from today? Did you lose a job? You can get a better one. Are you injured? You can heal and you can modify your workout while you get better. Have you failed a class? It's an opportunity to go deeper the second time through. Did the game get away from you? Let it motivate you by preparing for the next one. Was the presentation you worked hard on, was it a royal dud? Modified in light of feedback next time you give it. Has your marriage been shattered? Learn. And God may bless as in the learning process. He may bless in ways with Jesus-centered companions down the road. Are your kids living beneath their potential? Share with them your own failures. Is your place of employment still a drag to work at? You can make it better. You can be the best co-worker in the shop. Have you disappointed yourself morally or relationally? Build character. You can bounce back. That's not who you were and who you are and who you're meant to be. And you know it. Do you have this vague sense that your entire life has been one bad decision after another? There's someone who was joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, so that you could get past that. And you could start anew. He was joyful in hope. He was patient in affliction. He was faithful in prayer. And his name is Jesus. You know how in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his death, he struggled with God in prayer. And he said, man, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. And during this prayer, Jesus was in anguish. He sweat. Luke tells us, great, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. And never has earth offered such an urgent prayer request as that evening, that night. Jesus was faithful in prayer, Paul says. As Jesus got up from his time of earnest prayer, the sound of the mob arrives, and Judas has arrived, and he, Jesus, had fed so many, he had preached to so many, he had healed so many, he had showed compassion to so many, yet no one came to his aid in a time like this in a way that would have been appropriate. And, and Jesus says to Judas, do what you came for. Jesus was patient in affliction. And after this, we see the disciples and they all desert him. And they witness his miracles and they heard all of his teachings and they experienced his compassion day after day. They followed the mockery of the trial, the whipping and the scourging, the crown of thorns, the journey, the Golgotha journey, the crucifixion. They heard him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And yet somehow in all of this, he maintains a joyful, hopeful focus. And the Hebrew writer says it, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. He had joy and he had hope. And what was this hope? That after the humiliation of the cross, there would be an exalting at the Father's right hand. The Father would truly be pleased with his life. And he would have the assurance of that. And Jesus' hope was to bring reconciliation and peace between God and man through his blood. Shed his blood on the cross. Jesus was joyful in hope. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You need Jesus. And that's the only sure way that you have of being able to bounce back from the tough things in life. You're asking maybe, is there any hope for me, Joey? Is there any hope for us? Is there any hope for my life, my situation? Someone said in my reading this week, they said, when we say a situation or a person is hopeless, we are slamming the door in the face of God. To despair is to turn your back on hope. A parent decides to abuse or exclude a child from their love. A terrorist decides to take another life. A a teenager decides to do drugs. A woman buries her past with alcohol. An emotionally distant father shames a son. A codependent mother controls a daughter. A meth addict decides to steal once again from his family to support his or her habit. An older cousin decides to molest. An adult decides to gratify senses at any cost. A family member decides to get physical and violent and verbally abusive. A nation decides to elect what presidential candidates. One is depicted as a grabber and a groper and one is a a, a person who deceives and who uh, uh, likes to rip life from the womb. At any age. Is there any hope? The greatest life of despair I know. Is when someone decides to stop loving. Someone prayed last week. That the presidential candidates are us. They reflect who we are. And who we have become. We are the grabbers. And the gropers. The liars. And the deceivers. That's who we are. Outside of Christ. But through Christ. We've been offered a way out of it. And in people like Paul, whose entire life pointed to Christ. In people like our Savior, who we find comfort and hope in. These men learned what it means to bounce back from really hard places. Joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. That's what love does. And your friends and family need you to be resilient today. And that long litany, that long list I just read, that's the type of stuff that happens in congregations just like this. And I'm so sorry that that is true for some of you. I am so sorry. But you can bounce back. And you can make it. And this is our solution this morning. I want you to, sometimes uh, guys and gals will send me links to (laughs) Okay, so here we are.
You know, I kept waiting for one of the candidates to read uh, 1 Corinthians 13 at one of those debates. Never happened. And that's life. That's life. But one of the, um, one of you sent me a link this week. And it really caused me to take pause and to think. Thank you, Robbie, for sending me the link. Let's run the, run the clip. Wow. Kind of peeled my ears back. Yes, let's do one of those, shall we? Yeah, that's the new amen. <laughs> what love does, Christianity lived out 24-7, 365. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for bringing us together once again this week. And thank you for the wise words of the great apostle, the great example of Jesus, our Savior. And God, I ask and pray that the church would be the best news the world ever has received. That no matter what happens in elections, and God, we ask and pray that your values and the things that you love are honored in our nation and that you would help us to have the wisdom to know how to proceed, how to think in casting votes and living a life and doing what our brother here has suggested that we do, that we live out the truth where we are and that this is what connects with the heart of Jesus the most. And I just ask and pray you would help us to bounce back. And quite honestly, it's been a very discouraging and desperate time. And uh, we feel the despair. And we see the despair. But we cannot let it shape or define us. We have to bounce back. We have to move forward. And we want to honor you as we do. And so we ask and pray this morning that you would be with our congregation and you would be with those in life here who are up against some great odds. And it's only through your grace that they're going to be able to be of use to you and your kingdom and to live a God-honoring life. It's only through your help and strength. And so we pray that they would have that this morning. And when times get hard and the day gets long and the night is even longer that we would have your presence and friends around us and we could even see the humor in life knowing that there's hope and that brings us joy that there is patience and affliction and that brings us fortitude to endure and that we can pray with faithfulness and open up avenues for you to new avenues for you to work in our life in our situation. We ask this in your name. Amen. All hearts free and minds clear. Thank you. You've been a great group. And uh, we're going to just close it out today and dismiss you uh, from an audio adrenaline song, Love is Stronger, I believe is the title. So once you fire that up, guys, and once you hear the first notes, you can stand and be dismissed.